Hey, welcome to 12 Tone, it's Q&A time again, and joining me to ask the questions is my friend Betty from the art education channel Articulations. Take it away, Betty. Alex Ulysses Nickel asked, thoughts on Kendrick winning the Pulitzer? Okay, so as a disclaimer, I haven't listened to Damn, the award-winning album in its entirety, so I can't comment on it as a complete work of art, nor do I know for sure whether or not it deserved a Pulitzer. That said, what I do know from watching this all unfold on Twitter is that a lot of people who are very confident it didn't also haven't listened to it, or if they have, aren't familiar enough with the genre conventions and musical vocabulary of hip-hop to judge it on its own merits. That's not to say you can't enjoy hip-hop and still think Damn didn't deserve the award, but most of the objections I've seen aren't really about the specific work, they're about the idea of rap music being recognized as legitimate by a prestigious institution like the Pulitzer Prize. But hip-hop's almost 50 years old now. It's a part of music whether you like it or not, and Kendrick Lamar and other artists of the genre are doing important work that deserves to be recognized. If you want more thoughts on this, Adam Neely did a whole video about it, and I'd co-sign basically every everything he said, except for his opinions on specific jazz artists, for which you can safely assume I have no stance. Next. Max Headroom asked, how do you feel about your videos about certain songs becoming your most popular content? Are you ever tempted to just make those? Honestly, I'm torn. I love making the analysis videos and I'm really glad they do well, but I have often wondered if the channel might grow faster if I stopped doing everything else and just published one analysis per month. The algorithm would certainly like me more, but I don't think I'd be able to do it. I really enjoy the more obscure, weird stuff stuff that I talk about in between, and making 12 Tone would be a lot less fun if I didn't get to explore those ideas too. I like the way the analysis videos work as, like, flagship content to pull people in so I can trick them into learning about things like all interval 12 Tone rows, and I think doing both is a big part of what makes this channel work. Next. John M. Scott asked, Can you explain why Western musicians choose Ionian as the home scale, as opposed to Lydian? So for those of you who don't know, Ionian is another name for the major scale. And Lydian is a major scale with a raised fourth degree. If you want to know more about them, you can check out our video on modes, but to answer the question, I think it all comes down to tension. Traditional Western harmony is all about tension and release, and Lydian has a very resolved sound. We can see this by looking at the most dissonant interval, the tritone. In Ionian, it's between the seventh degree and the fourth, which surrounds the root and third, giving us a really strong pull back to the one chord. In Lydian, though, the tritone is between the root and the sharp four, which means we can't really resolve it. It's hard to point to the root if you're already playing it. This means we can't really create the engine we're looking for so even though Lydian is brighter, Ionian is a better candidate for the major scale. Next. Keenan Elijah Dolan asked, Do you think atonal music will ever be widely accepted in popular music? Depends what you mean by atonal. We tend to associate that term with movements like serialism that are intentionally, aggressively dissonant, and while I don't like to say never because the future is a long time, I'd be pretty surprised to see that becoming a regular feature of popular music within my lifetime. However, some theorists argue that this sort of music should actually be called antitonal, and that the term atonal better describes styles like the Impressionists and certain late romantics, where the music just lacks a strong strong tonal center either because the key keeps changing or because it just doesn't really have one. This is also sometimes called post-tonal music, and I see no reason why it can't exist in pop. Next. Flynn asked, do you think your autism changes the way you experience music? Probably, although I'm not sure how because I've never had the chance to try listening to music without being autistic. One thing I do know is that I have a really strong aversion to background music. Not like film scores, that's meant to be there and it's designed to complement the art that it's a part of. But at restaurants, parties, and other public spaces, playing music is utterly irrelevant to the surrounding experience and I pretty much always wish they'd just stop. Next. The Moon Raven asked, What, in your opinion, is the best key? My favorite key to play in is D minor. I just really like the way it lays out on a piano. But if I say D minor, everyone will assume it's a Spinal Tap reference, so instead I'll go with my second favorite key, B flat. Next. Knowing Better asked, What top 40 pop song are you ashamed to admit you enjoy? None. Not because I don't like any pop songs. I enjoy quite a few. Recently, for instance, I've been pretty into Ariana Grande's Side to Side, but I don't feel bad about that because I'm largely just over the idea of guilty pleasure. I like what I like, and I don't see the point in apologizing for enjoying something harmless. Plus, if you look at the production and arrangement of pop songs, they're often really intricate and complex. It takes a lot of skill to be simple without being boring. Next. Adrian asked, What celebrity or person of note alive or dead, would you most like to have a drink with? Probably my grandfather. He died six years ago and had Alzheimer's for a long time before that, but I think he'd be proud of what I'm doing and I'd love the chance to show him. And before you say he doesn't count, he co-wrote the very first paper on the experimental proof of carbon dating, his doctoral thesis is classified because he worked on the Manhattan Project, and he helped lead the development of the National Lunar Sample Research Program, so I think it's fair to call him a person of note. Besides, it's my Q&A, so I get to make the rules. Next. Ellie asked, what if chords were represented geometrically? 
symmetrically, with each side being the frequency of a note. That's actually a thing. It's called a tonnet, and it's from a school of theory called Neo-Riemannian Analysis. To build one, we start with a line of notes going up a perfect fifth at a time, so like G, D, A, E, B, etc. Then we add a diagonal where the notes are a major third apart. Finally, we add the other diagonal, which represents movement by minor third, and bam! It's a bunch of triangles. But not just any triangles. If we look at the corners, each triangle represents a triad. The ones pointing up are major triads, like this A major, and the ones pointing down are minor. The reason this matters is that it gives us a way to describe how close two chords are without having to worry about something like a key center. For instance, we saw this A major here, and if we go just two triangles over, we can find F major, which tells us that even though we don't tend to see these two in the same key, in a sense they're just as close as A and E. This can be a really useful tool for exploring that post-tonal stuff we were talking about before where keys are vague or non-existent. Next. Zach asked, does a song necessarily have to be complex to be good through the eyes of someone who has studied so much music theory? Nope. As far as I'm concerned, artistic quality is completely independent of theoretical complexity. Well, not completely. Theory is really useful for figuring out how to express artistic ideas, but there's plenty of songs I enjoy that are pretty musically straightforward because they've managed to capture something that moves me. If anything, I think it's more dangerous to be too complex because you risk drowning out whatever it is you're trying to create. Next. Jake Fine asked, what's your favorite YouTube channel you wish had more exposure? Oh, so many. For starters, everyone I've ever done a collab or Q&A with, including Betty's channel, Articulations. But y'all are looking for music stuff, so if I narrow this down to just music channels, then my number one recommendation would have to be Quarter Tuned, which is by a film composer making videos about film and TV scores. They're relatively new, but they're already doing great stuff, and if you like what I do, you should really check them out. Next. Nintendo64 asked, can vague concepts like soul and feeling be analyzed in music theory? Sort of, but not directly. They're incredibly subjective labels, so it's hard to build clear structures around them. What we can do, though, is look at the characteristics shared by songs that tend to get those labels and then analyze that as a sort of proxy. For example, the concept of soul is often associated with powerful gospel-style deliveries and driving R&B rhythms, and we can look for those as markers of how much soul a song has, even if we can't directly quantify the idea. Anyway, that seems like a good place to stop, but before we go, I wanted to thank Betty again for helping us out. Her channel, Articulations, combines examinations of the world of fine art with the more down-to-earth practices of professional design, looking at the work of artists like Yoyoi Kusama, and also diving into questions about building codes and accessible design. It's a really interesting mix. Also, if you're gonna be at VidCon this year, Betty and I are gonna be on a panel together called EduTube Beyond the Sciences, talking about the arts and humanities with Danielle Bainbridge from The Origin of Everything, A.E. Prevost from The Ling Space, Sarah Urist Green from The Art Assignment, and also some random dude who does vlogs sometimes. I think his name is like John Green or something? I don't know, I guess he writes books too. No big deal. Anyway, thanks to everyone for the questions, and thanks to you for watching. If you want early warning for the next Q&A, our Patreon patrons get notified first, and we also collected questions on Twitter, Facebook, and through our mailing list, so follow us on any of those platforms, like, share, comment, subscribe, and above all, keep on rockin'.